My name is Rabbi David Pardo. Welcome to the program. We have a different program for you tonight. We've brought together two uh, important key communal figures to talk about one broad issue, um, and that's, that's abuse in various manifestations. The most, all of us, you know, we're, we're practicing staying home. And uh, for m many of us, it's a mixed blessing. Um, I know having my you know, kids running all over the house and it looks like trash and this one's in school, that's cool. It's, uh, you know, there's positives, and negatives, but uh, I mostly go to sleep at night with a smile on my face. Um, it is impossible to ignore the fact that it is not so simple to be cooped up at home for a lot of people for very different reasons. And it's important that we have this conversation that we're aware of what's going on in our community. And I am excited in a, you know, COVID Roche kind of way to talk to people who really understand what's going on, what we need to know, what we can do uh, to, to be better, to be better neighbors and to be better spouses and to be better parents and better children. So I'd like to introduce, without further ado, my next guest is Tzvi. Good luck. You there? Um, hi, how are you? Good morning. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Tzvi Gluck is the CEO of Amudim, is a, a neighbor downstairs at 11 Broadway. <laughs> um, and you're working not just from home, you're working overtime. This is a, uh, this is a very tentative time for everyone at Amudim, I take it. Uh, yeah, that's an understatement. Um, and we were neighbors, and hopefully we'll be neighbors again soon when we get back to work. That's a shame after the storm. Yep. But uh, in the meantime, how, how has, uh, has COVID-19 affected the work? First off, for people who don't know, what, what is the work within the scope of Amudim? Um, and then how has it been affected by COVID-19? So uh, Amudim was founded just a little bit over six years ago uh, with Mendy, Shal Mendy Klein, Olava Shalom, and myself. Uh, together with Maishi Wolfson originally to destigmatize sexual abuse and addiction within the community. Uh, and it quickly grew from there to a comprehensive clinical case management organization in which by all of our staff are all clinicians, they're all mental health professionals, and they help families that are going through issues of addiction, abuse, or severe mental illness, not just by providing the care for the person themselves that's in the ACE sorrow, but for everybody else around them. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, what we have found is that when we help the entire family as a unit or we build a better support structure, it creates uh, much longer sobriety for those that are struggling with addiction. Uh, it creates better healing for those that were victims of abuse and it helps uh, in general. The other components of Amudim is we do a lot of awareness events, programmings, we put out a lot of PSA videos um, to again, destigmatize these issues. And over the last six years, we've grown to where we not only have the office in 11 Broadway, but we have offices in Cleveland and Miami and Lawrence and Muncie and in Yerushalayim and Israel. And uh, our basic main work is the comprehensive case management. However, we also get involved in crisis intervention matters and in placements. And it's really taking a 30,000 foot view. So it's not just about getting, let's use the addiction component just to make it simple. It's not just about getting the person who's struggling with addiction into the proper detox or rehab or program, but also making sure that their spouse, their parent, their siblings, their children, their loved ones are all getting the proper care as well, which will help <clears throat> the entire unit um, be able to heal properly. And the same on the uh, sexual abuse side, which is a little more complex because the bulk of our clients are people that were abused at home by close family members or close friends. Who they are now in quarantine with. Well, which we'll get to that in a second, but yes, that is a major uh, issue of how that's been affecting us with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, unfortunately. But what happens is, is that um, there it's more complicated because parents have to choose sides over if it's an older brother that abused a younger sibling, you know, they're choosing sides over who they do want to believe, don't want to believe. So there it's not just about the clinical care, but it's also about getting the family to understand what's really going on so they can be there um, for their loved one who was abused, who needs the most help. So I imagine uh, this, this work is difficult always, but I imagine now... Um, let's say uh, 
kids are spending a lot more time with their parents and parents are coming to realize habits that their children have, uh, you know, or, you know, people are just in closer quarters <coughs> and are finding out things. Uh, how, how's that, how is that impacting the, the, the drug abuse side? So uh, we've had a lot more clients over the last week to week and a half that have actually um, been struggling with remaining sober and we're working overtime to try to provide as much support and resources as we can. But unfortunately, um, we do have quite a few that we've needed to replace back into facilities, detoxes and rehabs because they, they have fallen off the wagon as a result of the stress, anxiety and everything else that's going on. Um, and also at a time that not many facilities are accepting new patients and trying to deal with the finances, especially when there's so many other expenses right now. Um, it's just, and I hate to use the word, but like the perfect storm, you know, it's hard as it is, it's hard to raise funds. Now we have somebody before Pesach when the whole world is trying to raise money for Kim the Pisca so importantly that all of a sudden now needs to go back into treatment. Um, and it also takes a toll on the family. So it's been extremely complex and, and we're doing the best we could with whatever resources we have to try to A, keep people sober, setting up um, AA, NA, SA meetings online, you know, through Zoom, Al-Anon meetings, SNR meetings, you know, online through Zoom, trying to create peer-to-peer -peer support. So we're doing as much as we can um, to help keep people sober. Um, and Baruch Hashem, for the most part, it's working. I mean, we have Menachem Piznanski has done a video series from the living room already, three videos that have been put out on the Amudim uh, Corona website. Plus, we did a live event with him on Monday. We're doing one with David Pelkowitz on Thursday. So we're trying the best we can with what resources we have to help. Who's, who's the so, target for your webinars? Is that your clients? Is that the families? Or is that just you know, the neighbors? That, Everybody. We, we want people to understand it, understand that these things are diseases, they're illnesses, and that everybody should be aware and be able to help uh, those that need it. So it's uh, targeted for anybody who wants to watch it. The other thing that um, we also have to remember is, especially in times like this, as a general rule, stigma is an issue in our community. Yeah. Especially now with so much else going on, the stigma becomes even more difficult because now family members are either know somebody that passed away or know somebody that lost their job or know somebody that has other issues. And now all of a sudden to be hit with, oh my gosh, now I got to deal with my loved one with addiction. Um, now, usually we're able to do a lot of events, you know, that we do all throughout the year. We do literally close to a hundred a year where we do awareness events and where we hand out Narcan kits and we do a lot of work, um, you know, to help before there's a problem, all of that is out right now because we can't do those events and get, you know, the communities to be more aware of it. So a lot of the harm reduction techniques that we've used are pretty much non-existent right now. Um, we are getting calls from families saying, can you please send us Narcan kits because we have a loved one that we're scared might overdose and we're doing the best we can to accommodate, but it's just become very, very difficult. You use the word stigma I believe what's the difference between stigma and shame and how does that play into your work so it really it can be one and the same um, the difference you know is that the stigma is on a more broader level shame is the individual level of the family so the family themselves might not want to reach out for help because they're worried about shame I, I, I use the word stigma usually linked with another s word the word shidduch where I say the number one issue that we have in our community is those that um are scared that because of potential shaduchim and because of potential other matters, they will therefore be scared of the stigma and not allow their loved ones to get the help that they need. And that's a big shame. How, 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 do, we, how do we get the help to the families? <clears throat> so the first thing we do how is, do that? Uh, other than me coughing, the first thing that we do is we do more events like this where mainstream organizations such as the OU and others will step up to the plate and let's break this topic out and keep talking about it so that we remove the stigma from within the community. You know, many years ago, people were scared to talk about um, quote unquote kids at risk. That topic became less taboo. People didn't want to talk about cancer. That became less taboo. If you go back 40 years ago, people wouldn't talk about having a child that was born with a developmental disability. That became less taboo. So now is the time for us to do the same thing and get our community leaders and community organizations to talk about this topic, to allow this topic to be frontline, which by the way, we're getting there. 
And we're certainly a lot further ahead than we were five years ago. So I want to just preface that, you know, I don't want to make this sound like, you know, this is not happening. We just need to do it more. And the more we can get it out there, like I have this global dream of having a Shabbos where every Rav and every Shul and every community will talk about the effects of sexual abuse and addiction on a family and a community as a whole. You know, you pull Isn't the there Rabbis, an, an initiative like that, uh, Dina, Shabbos, Shabbos Dina? Um, not that I'm aware of. No, okay, well, I've got to support you in email, I guess. No, then please, please put me in touch with them because when I, I gave a speech uh, recently to about 70 pulpit rabbis, I said, listen, would you guys even be willing to speak about this topic from your pulpit? And they've all looked at me like I fell off the moon. Right. So we have to keep, you know, breaking those barriers. And then uh, course, Sexual abuse, but also, also <clears throat> drug abuse, is that we're, we're sexual, reducing stigma around? I would say, yeah, sexual abuse, addiction, and mental illness in general. You know, those are three main areas that Amudim deals with and three main areas that need to be uh, destigmatized. Um, but as far as what Amudim is dealing with, with, with the corona component, we also, in addition to all those that were struggling with addiction, we have a lot of abuse victims that are either at home with their abusers or we've been able to remove someone from the home or the mere anxiety of possibly being at home with them, especially over Pesach. And, you know, usually we're able to work things out, you know, especially when it's an older brother type of abusive situation where we can, you know, find a place for the older brother or keep him in yeshiva in Israel for Pesach or find some other options. This year, almost all of our options are out. So finding proper placement. And sadly, 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 a lot of families that we're dealing with are choosing to have the abuser spend Pesach with them, leaving us to figure something out to do with the victim, which is really painful. Uh, you know, it's, it's a component of secondary trauma to the victim of abuse. Um, it's definitely clinically considered a re-victimization of the abuse victim who not only was abused, but now is being abused again because they have nowhere to go. And it's becoming extremely complex. Um, but we're, again, we're doing the best we can. Baruch Hashem, for the most part, we've been able to find solutions. Um, but there are still a little bit more than a handful that we're trying to figure things out. And it's just really, really difficult. What is one piece of advice you'd give to families who are not struggling with this at all and may, may not even be aware of, uh, you know, their neighbors struggling with that? But, uh, you know, it's happening. And how can we be better citizens and better neighbors? So again, I mean, awareness is always the key to everything. So if somebody, you know, the old expression, see something, say something. If somebody sees something that seems odd or seems awkward, they should reach out to a mental health professional and try to get an assessment of what they saw <clears throat> is, a potential, uh, is a potential problem. Um, the other thing I'll say, like from Dr. Zimmerman's uh, perspective, he said something very interesting because we do these group meetings every day with our staff. He said he's actually less worried about those that were abused and he's more worried about those uh, that were never abused yet, that now this might be an opportunity for new occurrences to occur. So there we try to tell parents to please keep an extra eye open on your children, on your siblings, on your you know, in-laws, cousins, uncles, just keep an extra eye. Not that we're accusing anybody of anything, but just to be really safe about that. And, uh, and then if you do see something, reach out for help. I, I do want to mention that Amudim in conjunction with many organizations, and I know that the Shalom Task Force is joining you as well, and they're also a partner with us, so we've launched a, uh, a support line that is manned every day of the week, um, including Shabbos and Yom Tif, 8 a.m. till 11 p.m., that people can call up, they can call anonymous, or they can actually give their information if they do need services. And what's that number? Um, the number is either 888-7-AMUDIM, or the uh, easier number to remember is area code 718-972-3000. And this support line is manned by licensed mental health professionals only. It is only clinicians, and they're there just to provide support on any of these matters that anybody has or any other matters, general anxiety, anything people are just concerned with. And if there's an emergent situation and they call, we have protocols how to deal with that as well. Uh, we want people to know that they're not alone. 888-7-AMUDIM. 888-7-AMUDIM or 718-972-3000. Spiegel, thank you for taking very precious time out of your schedule. Thank you for what you're doing for, for the call. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for doing your part in helping to bring these really sensitive matters to the forefront so that we can help those in need. Same to you. Take care.
here on OU Live. My name is Rabbi David Pardo. Today we are doing a special showcase on abuse within the community and the specific impact of COVID-19 on well, the COVID-19 lifestyle and how that's uh, impacting issues that were already there and maybe worsening. Um, like Steve Luck said, awareness is the key. My next guest is Dr. Shauna Fridman of Shalom Task Force. Shauna, you there? It's Friedman, right? Hi, how are you? Can you hear me? It's Friedman. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Um, you know, I, I, I got an email, one of the rabbinic listservs, you know, please share the following information. It was um, about, it was about a hotline, not, not this one, not 718-972-3000, but, um, and I, I posted it. And in the 16 years I've been on Facebook, because that was one of the one of the early schools uh, that got it. In the 16 years I've been on Facebook, I've never had a status shared more often, just more times. Yes. I've had more likes, you know, births and, and graduations and whatnot, but never more shares. So um, and it was about it was about uh, domestic abuse and people being stuck at home with their abusers and and for people to be aware. Um, so. It's resonating. So I want to piggyback on what Steve was just sharing, and Steve and I are very close colleagues, and we're working with them on their, the hotline jointly, is that I think the idea, the, the thought that um, what's happening now for all of us is very isolating, and one of the dynamics and central dynamics of domestic violence um, is really about isolation and how fearful we are. So I think this idea of bringing the awareness to everybody is so powerful because um, we're all looking to find ways to stay healthy in this very stressful time. I mean, we all experience that. So when I saw that you got those likes, and we've been doing that too, I'll tell you in the last 10 days, Sean Task Force, our social media is just so active. And I think that it resonates with people, right? The idea, the, just the thought of it being stuck in the house um, with someone who's abusive and really having very little, much more restricted access to help, um, it's just so frightening. Um, so I appreciate you bringing this out there because really awareness is the key. How do we make sure people know that they are not alone and there's, there's help out there? Um, so yes, thank you. And I, I, yeah, it's very, very frightening. Right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Meaning uh, most of the time it's terrible anyway. And yes. at least you can go to work or, or, or the spouse goes to work right. or you, like there, there's an out, there's an outlet and now there's none. So um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, I was taking um, hotline calls and I, I'm taking them with our, our hotline, which is um, we're working in conjunction with the mood and we also have our own hotline and I'll, you know, is that I've been taking calls with, with our, our staff and right before we all went in shelter in place around a week and a half ago, I guess I'm losing track of time, but um, I got a call from a young woman and she said, she said there's never been a physical incident, but there's a lot of emotional and verbal abuse in the home. It was right after Purim. There was a very assaultive behavior. Um, when he was drunk and she, I said, well, what made you call now? She goes, I'm so fearful of going into the house and being in place. Um, right now I go to work. She had a career. She gets, you know, she has validation there. She's treated with respect there. She has an identity there. Um, and right. There's an outlet, but there's also like an out, right? Quite literally, like she doesn't have to be inside all day. And here we are. Um, I don't know what day we're up to, but we're all inside, right? We're really, um, and what does that feel like with someone? You, you still can't say Corona with a bracha? Sorry, <laughs> that's time for jokes. I mean, it's, um, right, what does it mean to be inside? What does it mean to be um, inside with someone and how do you remain safe? And typically us in the domestic violence world, um, you know, and I've been walk talking to people on the national level, um, right? Like some of the, the things that we do to help people stay safe are not as available, right? We can't leave as easily. Um, our shelters, though they're considered essential services, people don't want to go into shelter in the middle of a pandemic, right? Like that's just the thought of that is like, whoa, like, could I get sick? Like, what am I choosing? Um, you know, so other interventions might be more strange. So we have to think very creatively with people. What, what are the interventions in your toolbox? Right. So what we do a lot is safety planning, right? So people call our hotline and um, we do something we call a safety discussion or planning is how do you stay as safe as possible in this situation? And, and that does not mean escape plan, though sometimes it does include that, but it will be really like, how do you stay as safe as possible? So physically, how do you stay as safe? What rooms are the safest? They might not be safe, the safest in your home. So typically we talk about kitchens are not safe and it gets kind of graphic if you think about it, but like kitchens have a lot of weapons. I mean, it's hard, to, it's hard to think about that. Um, it's, it's hard to think about that.
Um, so um, it's really like, um, how, how do we stay safe as possible in this situation? How do we stay in rooms that are safe as possible? How do we, um, how do we stay out of bathrooms? What room is really the safest? And then we also think about like, where can you, who can you call? How do you still stay connected? Because so much of the central dynamic of domestic violence really is around isolation. And here we are all being isolated. So what is the central dynamic that we could, how can we stay connected? So who in your life can you tell and what can they do to make you feel affirmed? And is there a code word if it gets really bad? So, you know, you're not able to say to your friend, really he's- Code word, sorry, with, with code like- word. I'm saying yeah, like, like a friend, like who's a cover Yeah, like let's say you could stay in touch with a friend, but it's too hard to call a hotline, right? Maybe it's just too hard to call a hotline. Yes. Yeah. So maybe you could tell a friend, you know, if I say to you, I'm really hot in here, that means you need to call the police, right? So you still stay connected to someone. And then if it really gets bad, you could say that. So we think about ways, how can you stay, how can you stay connected? How can you make sure you get access to what you need to stay as safe as possible? The other piece that we need to talk about is really also emotional safety, because right now we may not be able to do everything we need um, to, to leave a situation, but how can you stay as emotionally safe? And this is true for all of us. How do we stay as emotionally safe as possible right now where, um, where you can feel grounded? So how do you take time in your day, right, to say, okay, this isn't my fault. I am not alone in this. And what can I do? To, to stay in that way. So sometimes I'll tell you some callers, it really comes down to taking three extra minutes in the shower. Sounds silly, but it's their own space, right? And they might be able to just be alone there. Maybe having a cup of tea. We're still allowed to go for walks, you know, unlike some of our friends in Israel who are, have even more restrictions. Um, we're still like 100 meter radius. 100 meter radius, it's not very big, right? Um, I know that we, we go for walks regularly, right? How do we stay? Um, as, as emotionally safe as possible. And so we're working with people who are calling, thinking about th same things, both things. How do we stay as physically safe as possible, right? How do we stay as physically safe as possible in which um, um, we could just think about how do we, you know, keep things as calm as possible. And the hard part about this is that though the abuser is always responsible for the behavior, we will often talk about, can you, can you anticipate when something might um, escalate so you could avoid um, you know, physical harm? And then is there a way to stay as emotionally safe as possible? Um, but the real message is, is that um, we need to get through this. Um, we need to stay as safe as possible. And there are resources. So there's the Moodim hotline. There's our hotline, which is 1-888. Um, and of course, I'm linking right now. I have it written now. Because um, <laughs> this is what the day is like. 888-883-2323. Um, what, so it's 888-883-2323. So um, just before we, we jump to yeah, resources, I want to end, end on resources, but um, something that, that's occurred to me is a lot of people, God forbid, in abusive relationships don't realize that they're abusive relationships. It right. can take people years of therapy to even admit that to themselves. Um, right. Only when reading Mouse as an adult, like the, the book I thought was about the Holocaust when I was little, and I realized when I was older is about the Holocaust and about an abusive relationship with the parents. Um, you know, it's not obvious, but now people are, are, how, how is, how is the, this impacting that? Meaning <sighs> people even waking up to the idea that they, that they need help. I, I dare say there are people watching the show right. who are thinking about their neighbors and now they're slowly kind of like circling back to wait, I don't right. like the way he talks to me. That's right. So there are it. differences between, and I think, you know, maybe we should go back to that a bit, is let's define what we're talking about. Domestic violence, intimate partner violence is not about uh, um, a fight, right? I, I think that um, we're talking about a continuum of relationships. We have healthy or healthy enough relationships, then we move into high conflict relationships, and then we move into a domestic violence. Domestic violence is really about a dynamic of power and control. And how, do, how does that feel? Is there fear? And I'll tell you that that is a real distinction. Now, it is not up to that person to diagnose their relationship. And it may not be the time to figure out, like, is this a domestic violence relationship or is this a high conflict relationship? What you want to focus on right now is make sure people are as safe as possible, right? Um, and then there, you know, hopefully we'll be able to have time to, to manage that. So right now, you know, now when I'm talking about if you're, you're afraid of for a friend or for a neighbor, we could talk about that. And it's interesting how we manage that right now. But in this situation is to, to really just focus on like what is in the moment. Um, it is, it's, unless there is, um, and you know, everybody could choose to do what they want at this point, but unless there's a really big threat for physical um, incidences right now, it may not be the time to make rash life decisions, right? Um, 
it, it, there's just a lot of stress. But to recognize what's going on, call, call either of the hotlines, recognize that you could get, get some feedback from people, and let's figure out what we want to, um, how you want to go forward. Um, now so, with friends, yes, go ahead. Friends, no, please. That, that was with nice friends, question. people keep on calling us like, what can I do? I'm really afraid for my friend. What can I do? What can I do? So right, that gets very tricky. <laughs> right, it's really tricky. And the truth is, is that um, in general, that's tricky, right? We don't, we even, let's say, let's get out of the COVID situation. In general, you can't tell a friend when is the right time to leave a relationship or even tell your friend, I think your husband's abusive or your wife's abusive. Like that generally does not work. You can say things to the extent of like, I'm concerned for your safety or that was really uncomfortable. Are you doing okay? You know, really kind of I statements, reflective statements. But what someone who's a victim needs is connection. And by making sure that you're not judgmental, you can remain connected right? You have to, that, that is what they need. They cannot be, feel isolated because part of the dynamic of abuse is isolation, isolation from resources. So you are a resource to your friend, right? You might not be a mood, you might not be a shalom task force, but you are a resource. And if they feel that they can't come to you because you're judgmental or you kind of, you, you know, we've had people who are, will say to them, um, you have, you know, this, either you leave him or we're not going to be friends. You know, family will say that, like, we think he's bad for you. You have to leave him. Well, then when she chooses not to leave, because typically you know, it takes a and very long time to figure out what you want, yeah. right? Then that person now knows you're not a safe resource. So the job of a friend is to remain a non-judgmental resource to that person to say, okay, how can I be helpful to you? And really take a step back and you recognize it's their life and they have to decide. Now it's really hard, right? We don't, we're not in each other's homes. A call I got yesterday, the other day at a death, we were, I was doing some education to a, a different community. They're like, well, I'm really afraid for my sister and I can't get in touch with her. I just can't get in touch with her, right? He, she doesn't have access to a phone right now. And I was like, you know what, it's really tough. I don't have all the answers. This is a very unusual situation. But one idea I came up with is write a letter, right? The mail is still coming. Now, is that a perfect answer? Absolutely not. But a letter at least says to them, I'm still thinking of you. I'm not forgetting you. So how do we find ways to connect to people to make sure that they're not forgotten, right? And they still feel that they're able to reach out when and if they're ready, right? So that's a lot of what we're trying to do is just making sure that people know that, that when they, and if they're when they're ready that they were we're available for them and we can all do that for each other. Let's circle back to the resources yes. part. So, okay, so how, how can people reach out? How can people So resources help? um so there's our hotline which is 188883 um 2323. 23, 23. 23, 23. Um and then I'll tell you I mean this is always hard to say but 911 is still a resource. Um and that's an essential service and it's still available to people. And if people are in fear and they're gonna be, they need police intervention, I would encourage them, um, if that's what they need right now, is to still call 911. Um, Amudem um, is a great resource and they have longer hours and they're available on Shabbos on, on Sunday. Um, we're available Sunday mornings. Also, if you do call our hotline and there is nobody available, it will, it, you can connect to the national hotline. Um, and they'll be able to assist you. So there are resources out there. We know, and nationally we know this right now, is that some of the calls to domestic violence hotlines are decreased right now um, because we imagine it's very, very challenging to call when you're actually trapped in the house with your abuser, right? right that, like, that call happens when you go for- Right, that call typically happens when you're in the office or he's in the yeah. office or you know, there's some quiet time, um, often not on a phone in the house where it can be tra traced. So just, to, you know, we anticipate the be onslaught when we're all um, out of shelter in place, but even in the meantime, we're available to be assist, to assist. Um, Shauna, thank you. Thank you for taking our sure. time. Thank you for what you're doing. Yes. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to call us. We're here for you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll make sure to put that number up on the, on the post. Have a chakash resumeach. You too. Be well. Well, this has been a, uh, a heavy episode, but I think a necessary episode. Um, there are things happening all around us. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of uh, sickness, and, uh, and we have to be focused on our physical health, but we need to be paying attention as well to um, emotional health and social health, and these issues are issues all year long, and um, pandemic or no, but it uh, behooves us as we get closer to Pesach, to focus on uh, our our freedom in every regard. This is uh, this has been OU Live. Hope to see you tomorrow night at 9 p.m.